One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word. All you've been saying is quite right, I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap who always likes to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it. So I won't deny any of what you said. But there's one thing more to be said, even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things. Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and, and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that, in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only real world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing. When you come to think of it, we're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm going. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnian. Be thou my vision. Welcome to the Christ and Classics podcast, where we discuss Lord the classics in light of the Christ. My name is Devin Wilkins, and I'm joined with Colton Moore. Colton, we finally made it. Me. We've made it to. The best book in the series. Oh, uh, I don't know about that, but it is pretty phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's the best. But it's a you'll good come one. Around. It's uh, it's it's the most I think terrifying of of the book because it portrays it's a it's a clear portrayal of the the current temptations we have uh towards modernism rationalism materialism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh particularly the scene expressly in the speech that i just read which is puddleglum's speech which i think makes the entire book uh makes the entire a, series i don't know about that <laughs> But it is it is pretty um, pretty wonderful. Will Devin, you, uh, will oh, you do us uh, do us a solid and summarize the book briefly, and then I'll ask you a question, and then you can answer it, and my job is done. <laughs> Let's do it. All Silver right. chair. So we, uh, if you're reading in the actual order, don't be fooled by modern publishers who publish. Um, Magician's nephew, Lion and the Witch, and so forth. That's wrong. The Silver Chair is the fourth installment of the seven yeah, book really, series. They've really muffed the order. Oh, they've they've really muffed it. The theme mm-hmm. of muffing will be uh, will be rather big here. So we've uh, Lucy and. Edmund can't go back to Narnia at this point. And so we pick up with Eustace Clarence Scrub, who is a different boy. And he and his friend Jill leave their school through, sorry, leave their school to go to Narnia. Rather, their school is the means by which Aslan brings them to Narnia. There you go. And they, uh, they find themselves uh, in the far east on uh, Aslan's high mountain, like the highest mountain that goes up for miles, miles above the clouds even. Aslan blows Eustace to Narnia while mm-hmm. Jill stays back, and Jill is given uh, four commands, four commands by Aslan. I'll go ahead and read them because they're really important. The first yeah. command is that as soon as Eustace sets foot in Narnia, He's going to meet an old friend, and so he must greet that friend at once. If he does, they're going to have good help, both of them. The second command is that uh, Jill must journey out of Narnia. They must journey out of Narnia toward the north and come to the ruined city. So Eustace must meet an old friend. Second command is to go north to the to the old ruined city of the of the ancient giants. The third is that. Um, they, they're going to find some ancient writing in a stone, and they're going to follow the instructions on that writing. And the fourth is that they will know uh, the lost prince, whoever he is, because he will swear by the name of Aslan. And so 
Aslan sends Jill off. And the the story is basically Eustace and Jill and uh, a new friend that they meet called Puddleglum. He's this strange frog-like human creature that lives in the marshes. Mm-hmm. And they are trying to follow these commands. But what they do along the way is they muff. That's a term, it's a verb that Lewis repeats often. They muff each plan. Every single one, except for the last one. And so they they go north, and they uh, are in search of the king's son, the lost prince. The king is Caspian at this time, and he's an old man. And his son has been lost, has been taken captive or killed by uh, a wicked serpent. And they're going to go off to find him. And so they're following Aslan's plan. They nearly get eaten by giants. And then eventually they make their way down into what's called Underland, which is like this mm-hmm. underworld. It reminds me of Dante, uh, is descent down into hell, really. With There's a city at the bottom of it, and it's pitch black. And they get there, and they meet a queen. Ooh, and when, whenever you meet queens in Narnia, it's not very good. Not a very good sight. And the queen, long story short, has been keeping the prince captive and has enchanted him into believing that she is going to give him full reign over Narnia and they're going to go up and take over the overland. And um, there's the, and so she ties him up in a chair every night. This is a strange thing to me. She, this queen ties Prince... The, the prince, his name's Rillian, in a chair. And every night, the enchantment she lays on him wears off. Uh, mm-hmm. For just uh, just a few brief minutes. And he comes to himself. But she has told Eustace and Jill and Puddleglum that... Uh, well, actually, no, 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 no. He told them, the prince told them, that whatever I say, don't untie me. Mm-hmm. And uh, he swears. So when he's come to, and he's tell, he sees them, and he says, "Let me free, let me go, let me free." And then he swears by Aslan's name, the fourth sign. And they obey, break him loose. They kill the serpent, make their way back up to Narnia, where they meet the king. The prince is returned to his home. And mm-hmm. Aslan is there at a royal at a royal procession and blows them off back east to his high mountain where King Caspian's dead. And uh Eustace, by Aslan's command, puts a thorn into Aslan's paw, and the blood that comes from his paw is washed over King Caspian, who's resurrected. And there's a beautiful scene of resurrection. And, and then Eustace and Poe go back into their own world. Mm. And that's generally the the story. There's the, the book touches on a number of themes, most prominently so. And I think what we're going to talk about is the themes of remembrance and how um, Aslan controls all things in Narnia. Even mistakes and accidents, such that accidents and mistakes by Aslan's power are not accidents and mistakes. We call that in Christian terminology providence. Mm-hmm. We make real mistakes and, and, and accidents, yet by God's providence, his hand, his will, they are not accidents in a mm-hmm. real sense. And so. Yeah. I think Devin, your question is going to touch a little bit, a little bit on that. Of course, there's a whole host of other things that we can talk about. We could talk about uh, Michael Ward's interpretation. We could talk about um, the themes of. There's lots of ironic themes with the character in the character Puddle Glum, um, wisdom that he shows as well. But uh, Devin, take us away. Where are we going? Uh, well, yeah, I don't. I don't uh, know that I'm going to really add anything to what you just said. Um, I'm looking for an excuse to talk about that main theme of remembering. Um, or perhaps it's the main theme of forgetting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, um, 
Yeah. So uh, you read the you read the signs, so we don't need to reread those. Um, but those those come up in the this, was that the second or third chapter? One of those two. Um, I think it's I think it's the second one. Let me just double check. Yeah, the second chapter. And um, well, I'm I'm curious why. I mean, there's something kind of similar to this in Prince Caspian. Um, I think Prince Caspian is the most similar, perhaps, to Silverchair. But you could make an argument that Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is. But but why is the problem of remembering coming about in Narnia now? I mean, we, uh, at least those entering Narnia have not really been subject to forgetting so easily as as uh, Eustace and Jill have have proven to be at this point. You know, in, in Prince Caspian, uh, no one remembers, no one seems to remember the ancient uh, stories, the ancient, the, the ancient history of Narnia, um, except some, you know, a few characters that had been hidden away. And similarly, in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, everyone's really hush-hush about the true uh, history of, of Narnia under persecution, under threat of persecution from the queen that she would turn them into stone. But here, in this one, the, the visitors from our world also are subject to forgetting. Everyone seems like they're subject to forgetting. Mm. And I'm curious as to why that is. And that's really, again, my, my hope is just to launch from that to discuss more of what you've already brought up, Colton, with, um, you know, the, the theme of remembering and forgetting and Aslan's um, working things out. And things like that. Yeah. Um, Lewis's and, Christian. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, the whole Narnia series is about Christ um, in right. flesh within this Roman mythology. But here it really comes out right after Aslan gives these four commands to, to Jill. He says, quote, say them to yourself. This is like Deuteronomy 6 coming out. Say this to right. yourself when you wake in the morning and when you lie down at night and when you wake in the middle of the night. And whatever right. strange things may happen to you, let right. nothing turn your mind from following the signs. And so to your question, what makes them susceptible to forgetting is there is lots of strange things happening to them here in this book, not the least of which is these massive giants in Harfang that want to eat mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, which so, by the signs they should never have run into those giants. Right. Well, I mean, like they were before they even got to their house, they were literally walking in one of the signs. These huge letters carved in the earth, big enough mm -hmm. to be as like a labyrinth they're running through. Um, and so I right. guess I guess we could answer the question from a couple of different perspectives. One perspective could be from the characters point of view why what specific reasons led them to forget the first three signs the second could be from the perspective of lewis and what's lewis seeking to accomplish by causing them to forget mm -hmm. and um that's where my mind more quickly goes but to the first i would think would you say that aslan is less present in this book, oh, in one sense, you may say that. Um, I'm just thinking, his he presence shows up and... in the beginning, in the end, yeah. And then there's that one moment when they're in the giant or the giant house, but it's. I mean, well, I'm just thinking in the Lion of the Witch, he's very present. He he fights and battles with them and saves and and resurrects the stone animals. And it appears and, to Lucy, and yeah, yeah. And, in, and in Prince Caspian. Where is he at in um, in Prince Caspian? Really, he toward appears the to end. Lucy twice. Yes, he would. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, mm. and then in the voyage, he appears in a few different scenes on different islands, and especially toward the end. Mm -hmm. And here, he appears at the beginning to give a command, and then at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we get hints throughout, particularly through the wisdom of Puddleglum, uh, that they're guided by Aslan. He says once that mm -hmm. there are no accidents and that we're guided by Aslan. Right. And I I think in one sense, perhaps maybe he seemed to, he didn't seem any less present, but he just doesn't make an appearance mm. in the middle. And what do you, so what do you think? Of, what do you think about this, Colton? Maybe Aslan is not as present throughout because he's given them his word from the beginning. And oh, Puddleglum is there to remind them of his word you know look look here are the signs uh let's let's follow the signs and he's always encouraging them to to stick to what what aslan said uh, yeah. rather than um yeah rather than just well it, it's interesting sorry colton I, i'm oh i'm all over the place what is it that makes them forget well I'm not sure if there's any one thing that makes them forget. Yeah, I, I, I have a few ideas. I mean, agreed, there may not be one thing, but one, one of the things, perhaps, seems to be, or maybe this, maybe this could be the thing. Um, I'm not so sure about the first sign, um, but just enchantment with the lesser things of of the both Narnia and um and the underworld or you know with the giants they're enchanted uh -huh. with the comforts of the world. Uh-huh. Um Oh they, yeah, that's good. That's good. They don't like their pain. They're looking for comfort. And yeah. in the underworld similarly she's strumming her little thingamajig <laughs> and enchanting them with her soft voice and there's comfort in her sing song, you know, as opposed to, um, yeah, maybe the the discomfort of of the underworld. No, otherwise, the, no, that's good because um, before they like as they're approaching Harfang, all they could think about was warm shelter, blankets, mm -hmm. hot baths, food. And where had they been before with Puddleglum, who lives in cold marshes, right. who smokes a strange tobacco, whose smoke doesn't fly upward but creeps on the ground. They smell. Um, Puddleglum eats food that the, the children particularly aren't interested in. Right. Uh, it's hard marching, long days and long nights of... Uh, of... Uh, of, of uh, Walking, yeah. marching, right. um, and the senses, I think, play play a role in that. Like they're, mm -hmm. like I think of the hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, uh, mm -hmm. and the things of earth will go, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of mm -hmm. earth are looking very bright to them mm -hmm. uh, toward the middle of the book. Uh, especially mm -hmm. as the weather turns on them and it's really cold and there's snow and they're miserable and they get to the giants who they've heard bad rumors about, but they don't care because they just want to get in and, and get some relief from the elements, mm -hmm. not knowing that they're going to they're be all too. Yeah. They're all too willing to believe that these giants would be good giants. Mm -hmm. These giants would have them as guests at their feast rather than, as their feast. <laughs> so, could, so could we say that one large general reason why they may be forgetful of Aslan's commands is their uh, preoccupation with immediate gratification, some sort of immediate sensory mm. gratification. And that mm. causes them to forget the commands and promises of Aslan. Could we say that? Yeah, I think... I think that resonates. And then, and it's, so, it, so then what's the difference between that and the fourth sign? The fourth sign, they see Prince Rillian 
strapped down his normal self, and he swears by Aslan, the fourth sign, and then they decide to obey. Mm -hmm. What changed there? Yeah, let's see. I wanted to find that. It's in the it's in the uh, in the dark castle um, chapter. Mm -hmm. And oh, uh, yeah, you got it. Uh, So he says, "I adjure you to set me free by all fears and all loves, by the bright skies of Overland, by the great lion, by Aslan himself. I charge you." Oh, said the three travelers as though they had been hurt. It's the sign," said Puddleglum. "It's the words of the sign," said Scrub, more cautiously. "Oh, what are we to do?" said Jill. It was a dreadful question. What had been the use of promising one another that they wouldn't, on any account, set the knight free if they were now to do so the first time he happened to call upon a name that they really cared about? On the other hand, what had been the use of learning the signs if they weren't going to obey them? <laughs> Yet. Could Aslan have really meant them to unbind anyone, even a lunatic, who asked it in his name? Could it be a mere accident? Or Uh how if the queen of the underworld knew all about the signs and had made the knight learn this name simply in order to entrap them? But then, supposing this was the real sign, they had muffed three already. They dare not muff the four. Oh, if only we knew, said Jill. Yeah. I think we do know, said Puddleglum. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean you think everything will come right if we untie him, said Scrub? I don't know about that, said Puddleglum. You see, Aslan didn't tell Pole what would happen. He only told her what to do. Yep. That follow that fellow will be the death of us once he's up. I shouldn't wonder. But that doesn't let us off following the sign. See, right the there. Other, yeah. Right there, Puddleglum's courage. It's like this fella may kill us, oh. but because but but just because he may kill us doesn't mean we disobey Aslan. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean we can. Yeah. And just want to highlight Puddleglum here. Toward the very toward the very last chapter, Jill says, "Puddleglum, you're a regular old humbug. You sound like as you sound as doleful as a funeral. Uh, you sound as doleful as a funeral, and I believe you're perfectly happy. You talk as if you were afraid of everything, when you're really as brave as a lion." Like, he's so cynical throughout the entire book, but so full of truth and wisdom. And he's shining right here. He's like, mm-hmm. the fellow might kill us, and I'm pretty confident he will. But that doesn't mean we should disobey the lion. Yeah. And obedience comes first. Man, that's that's so encouraging. Uh, mm-hmm. It's And convicting. Mm-hmm. And And so I think... And then what do they do? They untie him. And so what what keeps them from muffing this sign is uh if I'm reading it correctly, Puddle Glum reminds them of the command. Mm-hmm. Like they remember the command. Mm-hmm. They recall it and remember the 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 weight of the command and they remember their duty to keep the command mm-hmm. and yeah. like how many times have you have you ever uh like given into some temptation or sin and you've hurt someone that you've hurt someone by like for example by like not restraining your tongue and right. you and you think after the fact maybe the next day mm-hmm. what, what was i thinking when I said that, mm-hmm. at least for me, my I often think, well, I wasn't really thinking about this passage of the New Testament or this passage of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. I was, I, I forgot all of that, and I was just focused on what kind of vengeance I thought I needed to take in that moment. Right. I wasn't I wasn't recalling the words of the Lord to uh, by way of memory to keep me in step with what he, he commanded me. And here, Puddleglum does exactly that. And he, he tells them the cost. He says, here's the cost. It may kill us, but we, we ought to obey, even if things aren't completely certain. Right. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. And, you know, I, I think of um, so. Puddleglum is just the, the perfect guide uh, for these, for the, these, uh, these kids who are 
all too willing to, I mean, they would have disobeyed. They would have disobeyed out of fear and they wouldn't have rescued Rillian. They, they likely would have, uh, Aslan says, either until you bring him home or you die in the process. And they likely would have kind of faded into oblivion in Underworld, right? Uh, as equally enchanted as he was, as Rillian was. But they have they have a guide who's like the the best spin on skeptics, you know? He yeah, he's he's not easily enchanted with the world. And as a result, as you go further on, once, you know, the the queen shows up and sees what's happened, that Rillian has been um has been freed when he was sober because it's this the the enchantment is actually a drunkenness of you know of, of her world but now he's sober and he's joined by these three other sober-minded folks and they have it in their mind that they're gonna do what they can to to get out of here but she immediately begins with ease to enchant them again and there's something as we already mentioned about, I mean, it's puddle glum again. Right? They were all going, <laughs> they were all going down, but for puddle glum. And he decides he's going to stamp his foot on mm. fire. And there's something about that pain. And Lewis says, uh... "Well, I while you're looking for that, I I wrote in my notes right before we mm -hmm. began recording uh, a question that I hadn't had until about an hour ago, mm -hmm. which was, is there any connection?" Any intentional connection by Lewis between the um, sacrifice of Puddleglum with his foot on the coals to kind of wake everybody up and the sacrifice of Aslan at the end with the thorn in his paw? I don't, hmm. I don't know. There's, I, there could be something there, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's good. Let me read this. And then um, we can entertain that. I think that's good. Let's see. So she's basically convinced them that lions are something, a figment of their imagination that they've mm -hmm. extrapolated from cats, house cats. And the sun is a figment of their imagination that they've extrapolated from lamps, just on a larger scale. Um, everything is childish tricks that they've, you know, they've, imagined another world that doesn't exist and um here we go puddleglum desperately gathering all his strength walked over to the fire and this is when the enchantment quote was almost complete according to lewis he knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as it would hurt a human so there is sacrifice for his feet which were bare were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's. But he knew... Uh, he knew it would hurt him badly enough, and so it did. Enough for what, you know? With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth. And three things happened at once. First, the sweet, heavy smell grew very much less. So the mm -hmm. smell had been enchanting. Just by means of him stomping. It grows less just by means of him stomping. Oh, yeah, because it's <laughs> because it smells like burnt marsh wiggle, which is nasty. <laughs> 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 and this instantly made everyone's brain far clearer. The prince and the children held up their heads again and opened their eyes. Okay, that's first. Second, the witch in a loud, terrible voice, utterly different from all the sweet tones that she had been using up till now, called out, What are you doing? Dare to touch my fire again, mud filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside your veins. Yeah. Okay, so so you've got smell, you've got um, hearing, and then third, the pain itself made Puddle Glum's head for a moment perfectly clear, and he knew exactly what he really thought. There's nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving 
certain kinds of magic. And then he goes on to say everything that you read at the beginning. Oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Because after, after it's it's not a one for one. Maybe not. But after Aslan has his paw mm-hmm. stabbed and the blood flows and it goes over Caspian, Caspian mm-hmm. comes out of a a a, a kind of enchantment of death where he's mm-hmm. raised from the waters and he's alive mm-hmm. again in his right mind, perhaps or something. Yeah. Like yeah, um, I mean, I do think that these characters are all on their way toward death under the queen, and it's Puddleglum who um, uses whatever speck of, you know, disenchantment he has left to um, harm himself in order to wake himself and those around him. and. It is, I, I'm, I'm still interested in, there's nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. Mm. Um, what is it about pain that disenchants in a good way um, regarding the, the, the magic of the, the queen? Oh, interesting. We have phrases, it just came to my mind, we have phrases like, snap out of it! And you mm-hmm. you picture somebody taking a friend and shaking him. Snap out of it, right? Or like pinch me. I must be dreaming. There's a, mm-hmm. there's a there's a pain that snaps you out of it. Or like, I mean, like I've got uh, I've got a child who sleepwalks, and it's it's pretty terrifying in the middle of the night to wake up and he's standing right yep. over your eyes wide. <laughs> and so what do I do? I grab him by the shoulders and I and I squeeze his shoulders. And I say, son, wake up. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. He just, he's just out of it. And I just walk him back to bed, lay him down, and he just goes back to sleep. But there's something there that pain jars us enough. Or like, like um, another example of, uh, of, a, of a friend speaking of a really harsh word to you because you're acting a fool. And he needs to get your attention. And so what does he do? Mm-hmm. He speaks very rough with you. Mm-hmm. He uses language he's, you're not used to hearing him use. Yeah, and he snaps love. you out of it. Right? And so what, what, what about it? it um, pain has a way of redirecting our, our senses, our, mm-hmm. our intentions and moods uh, mm-hmm. in constructive ways. Yeah, it wakes us up. It seems that there's kind of a lulling to sleep that happens uh, pretty consistently for for Jill and Eustace, especially. Um, whether it's, you know, they um, they were experiencing pain, and at, at that, as long as that was the case, it seems like Jill was remembering things fairly well. Mm. But as mm. soon as they get into the the uh, the castle or the house of the giants, they start to lull to sleep a little bit, you know? And, and then again, once they go into the underworld, uh, they start to become lulled, especially by the, the in a real in a comfort, mm-hmm. but also lulled into, into danger without knowing. And yes. I guess you could, you could make the same argument for the Harfang house as well. Yeah. I mean, everyone's What's... saying, Oh, the, these, these poor little bitty <laughs> things. And at first they don't, you know, they don't recognize that their lives are in danger. They're about to be feasted upon. Yeah. What's so there's a couple of things that's interesting here and, the, and mm-hmm. they're related, but they, they sound, but they're distinct. One has to do with through being lulled partially, they forget the commands and don't follow them. They muff them, used as yeah. uh, Lewis says. But yet, we find out um, at the end, and even hint- hinted throughout by Puddleglum, that their muffing of these plans was mm-hmm. all a part of the plan, such that their mistakes, though real mistakes, are... Uh, like serve 
of purpose that are that's uh, counterintuitive, so to speak. And so, mm-hmm. right at the right at the beginning of Aslan coming back, he says, "I have come." At the at the very end of the book, mm-hmm. and Jill sees him and says, "I'm sorry, but you couldn't speak." Then the lion drew drew them toward him with his eyes and bent down and touched their pale faces with his tongue, and he said to to them, "Think of that no more." I will not always be scolding. Here it is. You Mm -hmm. have done the work for which I sent you into Narnia. Mm -hmm. And you think, did they really? They just screwed up the first three plans. They probably would have found Prince Rillian in a much more efficient way if they hadn't have screwed it up. He didn't say that. He says, I will not always be scolding. You have done what I've told you to do. And there's the idea of, I think, Aslan's guiding paw, <laughs> hand, paw, mm-hmm. his providential hand throughout all of it. And so, such that your our actions that we screw up, yeah. Our, yeah. our sins even, have a real purpose in the story. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I think this, this story, The Silver Chair, provides a beautiful picture of what God's providence is like in in our in our story in his story mm-hmm. that he's written yeah um it's not too dissimilar from you know the story i mean the story of joseph is yes the easiest yes. place to go to right he had a dream and all along his life the dream is being screwed up mhm uh, according to human wisdom but you know you go to um Corinthians and Paul says, um, you know, the, uh, oh, you could probably quote it off the top of your head, Colton, but the the wisdom or the foolishness of God is, or sorry, the wisdom of men. Anyway, (laughs) yeah, I'm screwing it up, but you know, he, he juxtaposes the wisdom of, of men and, um, the foolishness of God is why foolishness of God. Yes, that's it. There it is. And um, how that's the reason Paul says I came um, and decided to know nothing among you except Christ crucified because the, the Greeks so prized human wisdom. And uh, yeah, God is just not um, not bound by our our wisdom. And I think as we read the classics, as we read great books um there's something there's something you know there is there's something of the the wisdom of humanity in a sense does point uh to the wisdom of god but uh and the best of it you know it, it, it certainly does but but not entirely you know there's a ultimately no one could have predicted from jo- uh, from Joseph's youth that he would have to be sold into slavery and uh, lied about and de- betrayed put into prison and and then called upon to rescue a nation of enemies plus his own family well um, yeah and what is most provocative and most awe-inspiring is that God said, or rather Joseph said to his brothers, right. what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He didn't say, God turned this bad thing into a good thing. Mm-hmm. He didn't say that. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So right. the actions that God meant for good, the actions of Joseph's brothers selling him into slavery. He didn't say, he didn't say, God's going to turn this thing around. He's saying, I'm going to cause this and make it good. Mm -hmm. And something similar is happening with our characters here in the silver chair where they screw up these commands and they forget Aslan's word. And Mm -hmm. that's a part of the plan. (laughs) Right. That's, that's why the passage you just read, uh, she's apologizing or attempting to. And Aslan says, Think of that no more. I will not always be scolding. He's not saying you actually didn't mess up at all. 
Right. Saying, no, you did. You, you, you did mess up. You, you didn't remember all along the way. It was harder for you. Um, uh, if you had kept my word, that would have been blessing to you. But I am still faithful. What you meant for evil by indulging mm -hmm. you know, the, your comfort, your, your desire for worldly comforts, I meant for... And so to bring us back around to your initial question, why did they forget? Well, it's because they were meant to forget. Mm -hmm. from, yeah. from Lewis's perspective, from Aslan's perspective. But why did they forget? From their perspective, we parse out the reason. They're enchanted by what's right in front of them and the comforts that they long for. And the the queen, you know, she thinks she's she's a, a power to be reckoned with, and no one can really defy her. She kills uh, Caspian the Tenth's wife. Um, mm -hmm. She abducts the prince, the heir to the throne. Um, here she is. She's going to take on, you know, these. Uh, these visitors from planet earth, but she's a tool um, yeah. in the end. And this is kind of off topic, Colton, and I know we got to wrap it up, but I was thinking, um, so she, she appears as a, a serpent at two points in the story. Um, once in a kind of a garden <laughs> uh, with the queen and the prince and then in the underworld, there at the end. And I, I want to focus especially on the second one. Um, you have the this soothsayer of sorts. This, you know, she's playing this music and speaking so softly and enchanting uh, these characters um, toward their death. You think those things are true, but is there really such a thing as Aslan, you know, and I couldn't help but be reminded of, you know, that ancient serpent in the garden and how, um, and it's interesting that it happens twice, you know, toward the beginning and toward the in end. In the garden and then in hell in the underland. Yeah. yeah. And in the second one, in the first one, straight up deception and the, the heir to the throne is, um, you know, enslaved, but then, uh, in the, at the end tries to do the same thing. And the, the, the second, <laughs> the, the second Adam of sorts and puddle glum says no. And, or maybe, maybe he's not the second who does the actual stabbing. It's, it's really in right. Uh -huh. So maybe really in is the second, you know, kind of the first and the second here. And, Packs it to pieces, um, crushing the head of the serpent. And yeah, so I, I really enjoyed the the kind of the yeah. biblical imagery there. Yeah, that's good. And one last thing, I, I think we would probably do a disservice <laughs> if we if we didn't mention at least this part is that the witch, mm -hmm. the queen, mm -hmm. and her underland, mm -hmm. um is a direct, it seems like it's a direct parallel with uh, our own modernist tendencies. Meaning, yeah, that's right. meaning it, 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 if she flips everything upside down to say, oh, well, you and your made-believe baby stories, just take everything from my world and, 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 and make up your own world. Mine's the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a common argument against Christians in particular and religion in general. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's right. I mean, if if your religion is true, it better be concrete, be able to see it, taste it, feel it, quantify it. If not, then <laughs> it's just made up. And right. at, at some point, we have to stand with Puddle Glum and say, you know what, modernist, materialist. You it, rationalist, you may you. Let's just say that you're right. If so, the made-up fairy world of of the Bible and Jesus Christ yields a much more satisfying life than the world than the than the life that you're offering. And so I'm going to stand with him. Mm -hmm. obviously it's, not, it's obviously not a one-for-one -one parallel with Puddleglum's speech, but 
there is some aspects there that we oh, yeah. can learn from. So what do you think? Yeah, no, I totally agree. It does seem like Lewis is um, stealing past the waking dragons in attempt to uh, give folks a narrative that combats the, the, the modernist and even postmodernist tendencies to, to undermine the faith. You know, he's saying, you know, you're so enchanted by, by this world, um, and find that, you know, the, the, the things of this world are compelling enough, such as, you know, well, what is gender, but a social construct, you know, <laughs> or something like that. And you find more and more Christians maybe in, engaging, not in a combative way, uh, but in a, you know, maybe tempted to believe these kinds of things. And I really appreciate how Lewis doesn't exactly take all of that. He doesn't take it all on uh, in, in the ways you would in a monograph. Um, but he takes it, uh, kind of goes undercover in narrative and, and licks it clean pretty well. You know? <laughs> yeah, the first Corinthians, the first Corinthians 2 passage you brought up, um, pairs really nicely and I'm just not making the connection. It's like, well, if um if the gospel is foolish, if I'm a fool to believe that Jesus Christ was sent by God and is God himself and he atones for our sins and he unites ourselves to him and raises us up with him into mm -hmm. the heavenlies. Yeah. If that's foolish, then call me a fool because it's a pretty it's a pretty satisfying life that he's provided for us amidst our sins. We we struggle, we sin, we muff the commandments daily, mm -hmm. intentionally sinning. And yeah. his mercy and the hope of that seems like a much better way to live than, than, to, than to live otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking of the modern hymn, Our Sins They Are Many, His Mercy Is More. Yeah. So good. No, that's good. Uh, well, speaking of that, uh, speaking of a, a, a hymn, you're mm. my favorite. Be thou my vision, <laughs> O Lord of my heart. Oh, <laughs> silver chair. This week, next week, we, we go south in Narnia to the Callerman with... Ashta and Avaris into the desert in the horse and his boy. Yeah, it's a good one. One that I appreciate more. And more. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. See you next time. Adios.